I'd like to introduce our, our presenter today who's going to moderate the panel, uh, Matt Fryer, who's an instructor of soil science in the University of Nebraska System uh, Division of Agriculture. So welcome, Matt, and I'd like to turn it over to you. I'm going to stop, share, stop sharing my screen and let you go. So uh, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks uh, to everybody for having me on here. Um, I'm from Arkansas. I work here in Arkansas, so uh, if you hear a thick accent, that's that's why. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank them for joining us. We've got quite the lineup. So I'm going to start off with uh, introducing uh, Dr. Steve Cohen. He's an associate professor uh, and state extension specialist with Ohio State University. And his program focuses on soil fertility, nutrient management, and soil health. Uh, next up, we have um, Sarah Noggle. She uh, started with Ohio State University Extension in 2013 uh, after being a high school agriculture education teacher for 13 years. So hats off for that. Um, she still lives in Ohio um, and uh, is married in, into a crop uh, farm family. And so they, they farm over 3,000 acres and um, and her, her specialty areas and extension include uh, farm management, farm succession planning, farm stress and mental health and soil health and cover crops. Next up we have Dr. Uh, Amy Smith and she's an associate professor and livestock manure management extension specialist at University of Nebraska Lincoln. And so uh, the next folks I'm gonna be introducing are, are gonna be some of her students um, who've worked under her um, in environmental uh, nutrient management, uh, livestock production, and, and soil and water quality. And so uh, next up will be Augustin Olivo. Uh, he's just completed his master's degree. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, and he, his work in his master's program was looking at transforming manure and cedar mulch from waste to worth. Um, and currently he works for uh, Field to Market uh, for the science and research team the Field and Market Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. And he's gonna start his PhD at Cornell this fall. So congrats on that step. That's a big undertaking. Next up, we have Carla uh, Melgar. Uh, she's originally from El Salvador and uh, just started her master's. Um, and uh, her research is gonna focus on uh, similar, um, transforming manure and red cedar wood chips from waste to earth. She's working on six farms across Nebraska, and she's also working on implementing a soil health curriculum for high school students, so that's pretty interesting. And then their uh, participating formal, uh, farmer uh, is, is Michael Hodges. He graduated from University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 99 with an animal science degree. And so today, um, he, uh, he has four children. Uh, they own, him and his wife own, uh, Hodges family Berkshires, and they also grow some corn and soybeans. Um, so I just want to again thank you all for joining us, and uh, hope I didn't butcher that up too much. And I'm look, I look forward to to hearing uh, some of your opinions and and your knowledge on on the topics ahead. And so I guess we'll start. Go ahead and start with uh, some of the topics we have lined up. Um, you know, I feel like since we're talking about kind of the three main nutrients, their, their interactions in a soil health system, I'd just like to ask whoever would like to chime in uh, to just give a brief summary of the science behind soil testing. Um, you know, main points on the nutrients that are being measured, um, total amount of nutrients in the soil, or is it just an index uh, on our soil test reports? Um, just talk a little bit about soil sampling protocol and a little bit of the research behind correlating um, soil test nutrient values to crop growth and yield um, and such. So just kind of, kind of, you can just take it where you want. I know it's a, a broad question and a lot of topics. So uh, whoever wants to take a stab at that, go ahead. Hello, I'll jump on. Uh lead us off here. Thanks, Matt, uh, for the introductions. Um, so when we think about a soil test, uh, there's, of course, a number of different 
such possibilities out there. Um, really, a, most commercial labs will offer, even state labs will offer a quote unquote standard test. And there's, um, especially in the North Central region, I suppose I'm talking about specifically, uh, those, those, there's, there's elements to that. So there's typically a pH measurement, a measurement of soil acidity. Um, often that's accompanied with a, a buffer pH or some sort of exchangeable acidity that will be used to guide a Lyme recommendation. Um, there's nearly always some measurement of extractable nutrients. And so that is a, um, a soil test extractant that is developed specifically to um, provide an index of availability. So it's not, as you know, Matt suggested, it's not a total number of how much, say, phosphorus or potassium might be in the soil, but how much do we believe will be plant available. Um, those soil test extractants is, is you know, it's kind of a, a long, rich history in terms of who does which extractants. Sometimes those fall along state lines. Um, in the North Central region, there's a you know large percentage of the labs run a malic three extractant, but there's perfectly other good extractants that are used: uh, bray phosphorus, um, ammonium acetate. Um, th those are the probably the most two most common. So um, when we so there's pH uh, measure of acidity, of course, there's extractable nutrients, and so that might may mean phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Typically, you almost always get that in every analysis. Sometimes they'll provide sulfur and micronutrients as well. It depends on the lab. It depends on whatever, but that's typically going to be done with the same extractant used to to look at the base cations and phosphorus, and then. Oftentimes you get a measurement of organic matter and that's uh, um, in the North Central region, again, almost always a loss on ignition. Uh, so it's a measurement of uh, combustion. So that provides a total index of uh, an organic matter in the soil. Um, so that's when somebody says I've got a two or a 4% organic matter soil, that's that test that they're reading that, that from. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'll let others chime in. I'm sure there was a, a number of questions. I'm trying to remember back to what they were, Matt, but I'll, I'll stop there unless folks have. Are we are we using the chat window for somebody monitoring chat window for questions? I assume that's how that, that's going to work. If you've got, there's obviously a lot of participants here, we're almost up to 150, which is great. Um, if you do have a question, of course, if you're joining late, go down to that, that toolbar on the bottom and there's a chat. And then one of the moderators here will be moderating that. Um, so please feel free to fire away. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Um, Augustine and Carla, maybe you guys can share a little bit about some of the um, different measurements that we're doing that are kind of outside the norm, like the, um, the cotton fabric degradation and doing some of the aggregate stability and arthropod um, enumeration, just some that we're trying, not necessarily doing on all of our sites, but um, looking for different ways to assess the soil quality. Sure, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Matt, again, for the introduction. And, and I guess uh, what Matt mentioned was uh, part of the kind of chemical property side of of things looking at the soil um, in, in our research project specifically, um, since we're look, trying to look at soil health more with, from all the from all the perspectives or sides, we look at chemical, physical, and biological properties. So the ones that Steve mentioned were more on the chemical side of things, but we also looked at in our research specifically to like um, different like physical properties and biological too. For the physicals, for example, we look at aggregate stability, we also looked at bulk density, and sorptivity, which is an indicator of water infiltration as well. Um, and then in the biological part, we can look at different lab tests as well, like BLFA or Haney tests that are common in uh, labs in, here in the Midwest as well, as well as we're doing like a counting of um, microarthropods, for example, to see, for example, how specifically in our project, how those treatments are affecting uh, the the microarthropods population that are important for nutrient cycling, for example. So 
we definitely think that all those properties are connected and, and, and the fiscal are influenced by the other ones, for example. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of like a summary connected to what you started with, Matt. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So no doubt that they're all connected and uh, all play a role in soul health for sure. No question about it. So Matt, there was, uh, you know, there's been a, a nutrient that's been missing, right? That we haven't really talked about so far. A kind of a major important nutrient for um, agriculture and for pretty much most of terrestrial ecosystem productivity. <laughs> it's nitrogen. So um, a lot of people are surprised to find out that we don't uh, routinely test for nitrogen. I mean, there's certainly plenty of nitrogen tests out there, but a standard soil, if you go to any commercial lab in the Midwest and say, I want a standard soil test, measurement of nitrogen is really typically not going to be part of that. Um, somebody, somebody tell us why that might be. I'll add in on that. Uh, there's just so many loss mechanisms uh, for nitrogen transformation processes, and uh, it's so variable across time. That's probably one, one of the main reasons. Um, like you said, there are some soil nitrogen tests. Uh, we have, have one in Arkansas we've developed for rice and are working on for other crops. Um, it works really well in rice, um, our flood irrigated rice system. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that would be one of the main things I would say is a reason why it's not routinely tested. I think that's, that's a great answer, Matt. Matt, uh, you know, for folks on the call that might not appreciate, um, there, of course, there are a lot of, a lot of different tests and it's a topic of great interest. People want to be able to take a soil test and be able to assess nitrogen availability over time. For nitrogen in particular, because it's a leaky nutrient, it transforms really easily. It's mostly organic matter derived, the nitrogen, you know, it's most of the nitrogen soil is in that organic form and it requires transformation from the microbial community to be plant available, essentially. It's really just, a, it's a tall order, almost too tall of an order to get a really good assessment or an indicator of nitrogen availability of the growing season. Arkansas is probably, I mean, very unique in the context of, you know, having kind of a land grant university developed and recommended method um, for looking at um, nitrogen availability. And that's that uh, you still all call it the star. Is that right, Matt? The star? Yeah, in star nitrogen soil test for rice. Yeah. That's an amino sugar test if you want to dig into the weeds um, that they've been working on for quite a, quite a few years there. So, um, it's good to see that, you know, we can look into Arkansas perhaps as a, you know, as a model citizen in terms of where we all need to be going in, in terms of trying to work with and develop these nitrogen indicators in soil. So it's a good, exciting story. I know Illinois has got a nitrogen soil test as well. Yeah, that'd be another one to look at. Anybody else have any thoughts on just, you know, routine soil testing and those chemical aspects? I think consistency is one of the biggest things with your soil sampling um, when you work with farmers and, and you know, knowing where that, that is and, and correct depth, um, going back to those very, very basics. Those are some of the keys that sometimes we forget or when it's hot and dry and, it's in the fall and you're pulling some samples, um, making sure that, you know, that consistent location and that consistent depth um, as you send those into the lab or someone, you know, walking alongside whoever's doing that soil sampling for you just to know what's happening on your own farm and, and making sure that accuracy is there. I look at those soil samples as, you know, they're the bench line or that baseline, um, no different than a human health. Um, you know, you wouldn't be prescribe blood pressure medicine without some sort of level of awareness. And so um, I kind of look at that as the same thing in our soil health as we look at that soil sampling. Yeah, those are great points. Uh, I think we all know that a lot, a lot of research has shown that nutrient 
uh, numbers on a soil test report change across time based on soil moisture and uh, soil pH certainly fluctuates throughout the year based on soil moisture and so uh, and nutrients uh, concentrations decrease generally as you move down the soil profile and so uh, sampling depth becomes important there so those are great points and it it you know brings back a concept that we haven't talked about yet but it's this idea of adaptive nutrient management right and so obviously this is soil health series but we recognize that um Soil chemistry and plant available nutrients is a key part of soil health, especially in an agricultural system. Uh, if we're, you know, soil sampling is really the basis of anything that we're going to be able to say or point to in terms of our soil and what it's doing. And consistency is an incredibly important concept, Sarah. But thanks for bringing that up. It's really important. Um, this idea that if we're soil sampling over time and doing it consistently, same time of year, uh, same depth, um, same basic methodology, then we're going to be able to look at our soil test report and see how our management is changing those uh, nutrient levels or the soil health indicators or whatever we might be testing. Um, and when we, when we do that, we're able to modify adapt right so this idea of like adapt our nutrient or adapt our management strategies and make changes based on that so people people will ask me you know um we'll talk this is another point on matt's uh question about uh developing fertility recommendations whatever i'm not going to get into that right now but uh in ohio for example our uh, soil sampling recommendations are based on a zero to eight inch depth and though people will come to me and say, well, I've been sampling at like five or six inches for the last 15 years, should I change it? And my answer is typically no, because if you start sampling different depths or if, you kind of th if you've got a history there and then you all of a sudden modify that and change it and you, there's no reference any longer. So I think a really important piece to soil sampling and kind of being a good steward of those records and, uh, really provides insight into what's happening in your operation. So that's something we always try to advocate for is just, you know, pick a lab, pick a, a time of year to do it, um, <coughs> sample every maybe three or four years, do it consistently. And um, you're going to be able to start piecing that narrative together, piecing that story together, what's been happening in that field over the last, you know, say three, four, eight, ten 10 years. And it's incredibly insightful, helpful for managing. Yeah, those are great points. I've got some questions here um, in the chat. Um, one uh, is kind of a statement question. Uh, in California, it's a requirement to create nitrogen management plans in high ground water discharge areas. Uh, are there other states requiring such plans? That's not a universal requirement in Ohio. I'll just say for that. In Nebraska, it's pretty well dictated by the natural resource districts um, individually, what they what they require of their producers. We have areas in Arkansas, um, um, nutrient surplus areas um, that we require nutrient management plans um, for phosphorus and nitrogen specifically where poultry litter has been applied um, heavily over time. And, and hay production typically. And so over time, uh, hay does not remove equal amounts of N, P, and K. And so phosphorus levels will build up over time and cause water quality issues. So in those nutrient surplus areas, uh, there is a requirement for a nutrient management plan before fertilizer can be applied. And again, that's, uh, that's regulated and um, implemented by our natural resources conservation service. So another question, um, how are nitrogen recommendations made if you don't have nitrogen test results? And so I'd say uh, in Arkansas, our nitrogen rec recommendations for you know, whatever crop forages, uh, row crops, uh, they're based on uh, years of uh, small plot nitrogen rate trials uh, and looking at yield responses. 
uh, to those different nitrogen rates. And so that's uh, across different soil textures. So that's, that's kind of how our nitrogen recommendations are, are made. Anybody else like to say anything on that? Well, well, I'll say that, um, you know, it's really a lot of, of course, fertility recommendations are derived from land grant universities and land grants and the scientists that work there uh, vary from state to state. And so there's a fair amount of variability in terms of how and, and recommendations are kind of developed. Um, in Ohio, for example, we have, uh, you know, we subscribe to um, for field crops, we look at um, a kind of a common consistent um, framework, which is an economic model for corn nitrogen rates. So as Matt alluded to, these are uh, strip trials that are done both um, in producers fields and in small plots. And, you know, we've collected each state individually has collected, you know, hundreds of trials that have kind of fed in to um, their database and looks at the, the maximum return. In other words, how many, for every pound of nitrogen you apply, um, how, you know, are you going to see a profitable return on investment to that pound of nitrogen? And then that kind of st steps up to what would be considered a quote unquote typical response. And so nitrogen management is, you know, it's a really, really slippery beast. It's a tricky animal. There's a lot of work that's been done on it. Um, you know, decades of work uh, from a soil testing perspective, from a just a agronomy crop management. There's a whole, you know, of course, a whole mess of spe specialty crops that are grown in the Midwest that all have their own recommendations. Um, so they're based on experience, on tissue tests. They're based on you know, weather patterns, sometimes on soil tests, but um, typically recommendations that are based in land grant universities are not like fine tuned by a soil nitrogen test in the same, in the same sense that you would get a phosphorus or potassium recommendation from a soil test. So, um, you know, it just kind of underscores there's plenty of work to do still and the challenges, you know, the real challenges of trying to manage nitrogen, um, especially in a really wet environments like we have in springs where you know, they can be sopping wet and then summers that can be bone dry. It's just, it's a very challenging nutrient to manage, so. Um, I would just add that in Nebraska, we have a, a formula that was updated Oh, it was before I started here, which was 2012. Um, but it's a, a based on expected yield and organic matter concentration in the soil and um, a soil nitrogen test. Um, but since I've been here, which is eight years now, we've constantly discussed revisions to the formula and how to accurately um, predict availability, what, what predict, um, availability factors to use for different types of manure and application methods. Um, so I, I guess I agree with, um, with Steve and Matt that it's ever changing. Um, we're just always trying to decide if we're using the best method or what, what needs to change to make our method better, so. Yeah, I would add to what Amy and Steve said that um, I agree that uh, multiple universities have like different recommendation systems and a lot of that is tied to like uh, soil and climate conditions. Probably the MRTN approach that Steve talked about is more like better fit for like uh, states with higher rainfall where probably like the soil nitrogen test is not as relevant probably because of like the leaching potential or there is more, more likelihood to lose that nitrogen. Whereas here in Nebraska probably and even if you go western to the western part of the state, we have less rainfall. So to account more precisely for that nitrogen in the soil becomes more important because there's less chance that we're going to lose it during the cropping season. So I think it, it, there are a lot of adjustments um, according to the soil types and the, and the, 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 the climate we have. And, and that kind of depends on kind of what, 
what approach each university kind of kind of recommends. But as Amy mentioned here, we have kind of like a yield goal base, but at the same time can be adjusted by the ratio between the corn price and the, and the, the nitrogen price as well. But it's more of a, uh, a nutrient crediting where we have all these credits from different sources and we, we account or, or add those up to see how much of the plan requirement uh, those contribute to. Thanks, Augustin. Um, you know, we're about halfway through. I really want to kind of get to uh, some questions related to soil health systems. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip down uh, to, you know, just kind of getting um, all of your opinions on, you know, what are some trends that you're seeing in, in fields that are newly um, have newly implemented soil health practices, cover crops, no-till combination specifically is what I'm referring to. Uh, what are you seeing as far as crop response? Um, you know, are you seeing positive responses, positive um, trends or, or negative? I know in Arkansas, there's, there's a lot of positives, but there are some negatives with certain crops like corn. Um, and it really, for us, it really, uh, brings out the reality that we've got a lot to learn about nutrient cycling uh, in, in a cover crop system here in Arkansas. So I'll just leave that open. Um, I guess I would chime in. The work that um, my group specifically is doing, we're not necessarily looking at cover crops and tillage practices within um, the context of our work, we're more looking at um, application of animal manure and um, like Augustine mentioned and, and Carla mentioned in their intros, um, we have a, a huge problem in the state with red cedar trees and so the Nebraska Forest Service is constantly looking for uses for red cedar and so we've, we've been combining that with manure um, and, and applying it to uh, row crop fields as a soil amendment and so um, Augustine or, or Carly could probably speak a little bit to the changes we've seen and not seen as a result of kind of replacing pre-plant um, nitrogen fertilizer with manure nitrogen. Um, and, and then the use of the wood chips because one of the concerns there obviously is nitrogen immobilization in the soil. Um, and we, we didn't have, we, we didn't see nitrogen immobilization, which was good. We didn't decrease yields um, by replacing the pre-plant nitrogen with manure nitrogen, um, but we didn't see any real significant improvements in in yield or um, uh, I, I don't know. We saw some minor improvements with organic matter. You might remind me, Augustine, since you just wrote this all up for your thesis. But um, yeah, it, nothing major that we changed. Um, but we didn't make things worse either. Yeah, I would add to that that, um, again, like we'll try to look at multiple properties of the soil to look at all the kind of analyze soil health as, in as complete way as we could. And as Amy said, from the nutrient perspective, manure reliably supplied nitrogen, for example, to the crop. Uh, in our study, in, in the way we kind of expected, using the mineralization rates that the university recommends, for example, for manure nitrogen. Um, that, and then also in the chemical perspective, in two out of, out of four research sites, we increased soil organic matter after a single application of beef manure, for example. And, and it was a good to see, but that also meant that uh, kind of the initial soil conditions and the manure type we're using may change the potential for this specific BMP to improve organic matter, for example. And we also increased pH, so acting more like a buffer. And on the physical side, we didn't see much on the on the physical properties like bulk density or aggregate stability. We didn't see as, as much improvement in soil properties uh, with manure applications, just with a single application, probably because those physical properties, soil physical properties take a little longer. Um, but yeah, I would say in general, like with just a single application of manure in general, we see quicker changes in, in chemical properties or the chemical side of, of, of things. 
Augustine, was that beef manure with bedding or just? Yeah, there was a little variety of, but it was mostly beef manure coming from feed lots, open dry lots. Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that we have seen uh, that manure and the wood chips do supply for the nutrients that we're looking for and we would find a lot of value and like keep using these amendments to see some changes probably in organic matter and see how that works over the course of the years because that's what we are expecting a little increase on organic matter especially with the use of the wood chips so that's kind of like where we are heading with this research Awesome. Anybody else on newly transitioned uh, soil health fields? I'll just say from the Ohio perspective, we, you know, we've done uh, some, we have some long-term trials. Of course, we've looked at uh, particularly with tillage and some with crop rotation. And we, you know, long-term trials are great because they they typically give you plenty of time to kind of see these differences accrue. Um, some of you might be affiliated with or even involved in some of this, like the Soil Health Partnership or other sorts of on-farm kind of uh, sustained um, conservation management practices that might be, you know, strip trial in kind of an experimental way. You know, some of the data I've seen from there, we don't have too many of the sites in Ohio, but some of the data I've seen from there um, is uh, pretty promising and just in terms of in aggregate, uh, not taking uh, too long, three, four years to really see uh, changes occur and detectable changes in some of these kind of measured soil health indicators that are based in the lab. Um, and so I think that, you know, uh, we need to recognize that it's a complicated world, that not all things are going to, you know, some conservation practice uh, that typically will increase soil health isn't always going to be a, a perfectly aligned um, great practice for a grower, right? There could be plenty of issues with growing cover crops, et cetera, et cetera. But um, from the, the the context of actually being able to measurement measure it and quantify that in a lab, um, oftentimes, you know, uh, three four years is kind of that magic number where we start to see detectable differences. So it's a it's a messy world. So those types of things are a little bit hard to generalize. And I would agree with Steve on that comment. Um, I think that, you know, as you look at that research and sometimes from putting that farmer hat on, you're your own best researcher to try some of those different things, maybe in small amounts. Um, but I think patience is sometimes easier said than done um, as you look at those changes, especially looking at both the manure and the cover crops. Um, the quantifiable, measurable type of results that you see are not always there. And so sometimes things work. Um, one of the people I've worked with a few times, I guess, you know, and they were working primarily in cover crops. They, they gave me that quote that says, I've never had a failure with cover crops. I've only had really good educational experiences. And I think that's so true when you think about that, that you learn something every time, whether it's manure, whether it's cover crops, that you need to look at that and say, what has changed? And, and I can tell you um, the short time that I've been with Extension looking at some of those fields as they're changing practices, whether it's strip tillage, whether it's manure, whether it's cover crops. Um, it's hard to quantify and measure those, but it's also, I can tell you, being the, putting on a county extension educator hat, you can see those changes in that soil health um, that aren't necessarily measurable when you look at the soil structure and those different things. And so looking at that, again, it's hard to measure that and there's no test and, and one year it's gonna be different. Your, you know, your weather conditions are never the same. So I think that's one thing to just keep in mind. But I also think you're your own best researcher is, you know, whether it's nitrogen, you know, turning off that side dress toolbar, you know, for a, a, a small strip, 10 foot, 20 foot, and seeing what's happening. Um, you can be your own advocate for those things too, to see what works. Yeah, those are great points. Uh, a lot of things are hard to quantify and measure uh, as far as differences. Uh, some of the, the things we're seeing in our cover crop trials in Arkansas is 
Um, we've got soil moisture sensors at 6, 12, 18, and 30 inch depths. And uh, so it's really interesting to see a rainfall or irrigation event move those sensors at deeper depths with cover crops. And um, even, even the cover crop terminated really, uh, really small, a six inch uh, grass cover crop uh, is affecting the 18 inch sensor. Uh, whereas in the no cover crop treatments, they're uh, just as six and 12 inch sensors are moving. Uh, and that's in some cases, there's always caveats to these things. We've got fields that, uh, where the no cover crop side is acting like a cover, you would expect a cover crop side to act as far as water infiltration and uh, moisture use from the cash crop. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's pretty interesting dynamics to try to dig through and tell a story with. Anybody have anything else? So I know this is a little off topic of, of just the soil health properties, but um, I thought maybe Michael Hodges might comment. He's one of our collaborators on the on-farm research, one of our six sites throughout the state. And um, he's, uh, we did injection of swine manure. Um, he has pretty heavy soils there um, down in the southeast part of the state. We're doing some um, additional monitoring on that site that we're not doing on any of the other ones primarily because that is a non-irrigated site and every other site that we are working at is irrigated so we never really get a chance to see how the wood chips are impacting soil moisture um, holding capacity. Um, so Michael maybe you can talk a little bit about um, for instance if you've noticed any difference in the treatments um, under the rain fed system the that you operate. And, and then Carla was down at the site last week, I believe, and mentioned that um, she thought there was maybe some weed suppression benefits from the wood chips. So I didn't know if you'd been out and looked at the plots and if you had any other um, observations that you would want to share. Uh, sure. Um, we uh, initially, when we planted the crop, um, and we put the wood chips on my my initial observation was that maybe the uh, weed control was not as good the pre-emergence herbicide didn't work quite as well uh, the burn down didn't work quite as well but then when we came through with the post application um, I think Carla's right I think there is a little bit less escapes um, we were able to clean those up with the post and I think there probably is a little bit a little bit better weed control where the cedar chips have been applied um, <clears throat> I think the two things I'm most interested to find out are uh, with uh, are we able to hold down the nitrogen volatilization where the chips have been applied uh, are we able to retain more of that nitrogen for the crop and then also for the moisture um, this year we've been extremely fortunate with the rain um, the corn crop I mean that the corn that's out there today it, it hadn't had a bad day in its life I mean we Every time we've needed a rain, we've got one. I think our biggest rain's been an inch 40. We've essentially used every drop of rain we've got. So I don't know if we'll see quite the difference that I thought we would this year as we would in a more dry year. But, uh, but I think that mat of those chips is going to definitely help to retain some moisture. And it'll be interesting to see throughout the year when those moisture sensors, when the data comes back from those, how much difference it has made. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. What, what about, you know, ultimately all of this is, what we're, you know, all we're talking about is these soil physical and chemical properties, but at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to save you guys money. We're trying to save our producers money. So, you know, have you looked at any economics on your farm with the cedar chips and manure applications? Has, have you been able to reduce fertilizer inputs or can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I don't, have hard numbers today but I mean it when we put the, the manure on we're especially able to save on the, the starter fertilizer or the pop-up fertilizer with the P and the K uh, we're able to pair those back um, almost in, in a lot of cases we're able to skip any commercial application of P and K where the manure has been applied for the corn crop um, so there's definitely some some uh, dollar savings there uh, it does take some time to get the manure applied and the, the soil conditions have to be right. Um, 
try to get as much on in the fall as we can uh, to stay away from compaction issues. But, uh, you know, we do make spring applications as well. In this particular trial, all the application was made in the spring right ahead of the planter. Um, and we, I, there's a little bit of an issue. You can see a little bit of an issue with compaction, but not, again, maybe that's because of the gear we've had, but not as much as I, I expected to see. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a, definitely a dollar value to that manure. Um, I actually, you know, 15 years ago, uh, it was just something we had to get rid of. And now you, I actually have some neighbors when they put new terraces in and things like that, they, they stop and ask if I'd like to custom apply some manure on their farms where those new terraces are put in to, to build the organic matter. Nice. So, um, I guess, is there any like single big takeaway that you've, you've gained from this research on your farm with, with the wood chips and manure applications, anything that is kind of driven or, uh, piqued your interest on other things you want to learn or, or anything along those lines? I'll let, I'll let Michael comment there, but I would say that this is his first year joining us on the project. So he's, hasn't been through an entire cropping season yet with us. The other sites were in the second cropping season with them, okay. but um, rain was a big problem last year and, and didn't allow him to get the field planted and, and we didn't get the treatment supply. So, um, so I'll let you answer that, Michael, but I wanted to put in the caveat that he's, he's relatively new. So he's probably still trying to decide if he likes this being on his farm whenever we uh, go down there to collect samples and stuff. Thanks, Amy. That's good info. Yeah, no, there's no, there's uh, no issues that way. As far as you guys being out here, I'm glad to, glad to have you out here and, and do the research and, and also glad with the curriculum development that you're doing with our local FFA chapter. It's important for the kids to kind of understand that too. But, but yeah, I think the, I think the main benefits are going to show up in year two next year. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, saving the saving the soil moisture, I think is going to be the big one. Um, and then, and then, like I said earlier, maybe we'll see some benefits from from additional nitrogen underneath of those cedar chips. Um, th those are the two big ones. But, but yeah, it, you know, Nebraska weather. We last spring was a disaster. We we were late. We had some prevent plant, and and then, like I say, this year we total opposite, polar opposite. I mean, we're we're very fortunate. I. This first year of the research may be the, we got the potential anyway for the best yields I've ever had on this farm in, in 20 years. So looking forward to seeing what the, what the results say when harvest comes. For sure. That's good to hear, on, especially on a year like 2020. So, yeah. Some good news in the world these days, huh? We can... <laughs> take solace in that yeah when you start feeling bad about the pandemic and COVID you just go out and watch the corn grow you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know when we talk about soil health a lot of the you know trends we see um, producers you know leaving out phosphorus and potassium and uh, cutting nitrogen rates and um, you know I'm, I'm all for reducing inputs uh, but I know at least in Arkansas, we've got a lot to learn before we can start making those kind of recommendations. Um, do, do any of you have any thoughts on reducing P and K and nitrogen um, in these soil health systems? Um, and I, when I say reducing those inputs, I mean uh, commercial fertilizer or, or uh, animal manure. So any thoughts on that? I'll, I'll just say for from the higher perspective, it's something that, you know, I think it's a burning question. We, we want to, you know, as educators, we want to incentivize and think about um, conservation and, and improving soil health. How do we do that? How do we make um, a case, a justifiable case for a grower to do that and make it fit into their operation and make it, you know, uh, profitable? Um, I believe that reducing um, fertilizer inputs uh, is a great case to make in terms of why you should, you know, adopt some of these practices. Um, but 
it's hard it's hard data to generate it really is especially to do it on farm um we are very keen on doing that we've kind of taken some steps and and are starting to put out trials to do this but it's um you know we're talking probably um three or four years down the road before we really have any good data to share or anything that's going to be um uh you know, good enough to kind of test up, uh, you know, test this, stand the tests of, of, of science or what have you. But um, uh, we, of course, hear a lot of anecdotal information all the time, and it, it, there's nothing to suggest that we shouldn't believe it, but um, that, you know, s increases in soil health are uh, accompanied with um, decreases in fertility. Um, requirement or fertilizer requirement, I should say, not not soil fertility per se, but the actual need for um, external fertilizer application. So I can just point to one uh, pretty academic paper that my uh, graduate student um, has published. And we went around, uh, looked at different corn nitrogen rate trials um, in about four or five different states in the Midwest. Uh, got archive soil. They uh, reached out to collaborators. They sent us archive soils, and then we essentially ran a suite of soil health tests on those soils. And the the general question was: Do increases in soil health in those soils translate into essentially lower uh, fertilizer requirements? So there's a couple of different points to that. So one is. Um, the difference between when corn yielded optimally and when it yielded as a control, a, tr a true zero nitrogen treatment. And then also how much nitrogen did it take to get it to optimal yield? So there was a couple of different sub narratives in there, but the main take home was that, um, well, interestingly, nitrogen, fertiliz nitrogen fertilization across these trials um, did help increase soil health. So it's a good lesson for us to understand that we do need fertility when we're, you know, working in these kind of high productivity systems, we do need to add something or, you know, we're just going to be draw making withdrawals from the bank account and it's going to, it's going to tank at some point, but essentially about 18% of the variability or of the, um, the difference in terms of that, that economic or that agronomic yield, uh, was due to soil health. And so uh, another way to say that, um, and some of the devil is in the details here, but it showed, we showed that essentially with, when we have healthier soils versus not, uh, it contributes significantly to in, an increase in grain productivity for those corn trials. So um, the way we had to do that because it was some kind of fancy statistics and it helped and it constrained a little bit of what we could kind of fully pull away from that. But it's, in my mind, it's very clear evidence and not surprisingly that when you have healthier soils, quote unquote, um, as, as measured by some of these indicators that we're looking at, you uh, have potential for greater productivity. So, and you know, that's a, that's a, a claim that will resonate with growers, of course, because you're talking about profitability and you're talking about ROI, right? So these are the types of things that I think as, a, as land grant universities, it really behooves us to kind of move in that direction, at least for some of this research to help kind of show growers that, um, you know, these conservation practices result in changes in soil health and that ultimately can and should affect their bottom line, right? So. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? I think in the short term, too, to go on along with what Steve has, um, we do have through Ohio State some research, and I'm, I'm excited this year on some of our soil health research through our eFields booklet. And so that's been going on since 2017, I believe. And, and looking at that, um, anyone can access that. It's, it's online through our, our college. But if you just search eFields Ohio State, um, that publication, and I can throw that down on the chat box too, but that shows just some of the different nitrogen trials that are being conducted, and then this year we have some new soil health protocol that will be included in that. Thanks, Sarah. 
I guess, uh, sorry, I'll jump in just one uh, on, onto that point. Um, I think that, uh, you know, kind of a timely topic just to chat with this University of Nebraska has had a kind of a rich history of on farm research and, and dedicated some good resources and resource development for that and, you know, can be applauded for those efforts. I think at Ohio State, we're, you know, really have been ma making this push to try to increase on farm research capacity. Um, the last several years, the eFields publication is a really nice example of that. But, you know, for growers that are on the on the call and they're kind of interested in some of these questions, I, you know, I just encourage folks uh, to reach out to your county educator, or state specialist, or whoever it might be, you know, reach out to the land grant because that's what we're here for. And we'd be, you know, uh, there's always challenges with time and money and everything else, but I, I'm would be very surprised if you're not going to be able to find somebody in your in your in your respective state institution that's wanting to work with you to answer some of these questions that you have. So just a, you know, I might be preaching to the choir here, but just a general call that there's resources out there, and and we're more than happy to help you navigate kind of some of the challenges of doing research and even provide some manpower to come out, people power to come out and, you know, collect data or help you analyze the data that you get. So um, we're here to help. Yeah, I would probably echo that here in Nebraska, as you mentioned, like we have a pretty extensive uh, on-farm research network as a part of the university and the extension system where farmers yeah can reach out to and like uh, ask for help on how to set up an experiment and and how to yeah set up an experiment to get like reliable data to make conclusions about things there you can you may be interested in testing and and that's like um plenty available for people to consult and 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 also as you mentioned to also even to, to collect some data so i think it's a, a really interesting way to to get reliable results from your own ground uh, with like really experimental, like not experimental condition, real conditions in the field. So I think that has a lot, a lot of value to, to make decisions as well. I know one of the things, Matt, that you mentioned when you did Carlo's introduction is, is um, our engagement of high school agriculture programs in on-farm research and um, that so Carlos kind of taking over where Augustine is is leaving off as he's moving on to his um, to do his degree at Cornell. But um, so Augustine put together uh, a curriculum and a soil health uh, soil biology inspection guide initially when he started that was used last year in classrooms. And then Carla will continue uh, working with the classrooms this year if they're back in school um, this fall. But um, maybe between the two of you, you can talk a little bit about the goals of those um, those resources and what was learned from the students that you worked with in the last year, because I think they really they were very positive about the um, the project. Yeah, I guess I I would add that um, yeah what we were trying here is like how to extend a little bit the the learning opportunities out of this on from research to as many audiences as we could. That's why. Uh, we kind of decided to integrate uh, uh, schools and on-farm research uh, kind of close to the um, where we are conducting that on-farm research. So, and it's been really good. The first year we implemented that, um, all teachers, those that those students that could visit the the on-farm research sites were were really excited about participating on 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 field measurements, and and that's what they said was the part they enjoyed the most of doing, participating actively in the research and in the field and, and measuring things. And, and as I said, that's what we proved it was a great way for, for high school students to learn about on from research and, and soil health and, and different BMPs to help improve soil health in general. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a great experience. So probably Carla, you can mention a little bit what we've developed in terms of resources precisely. Yeah, so some of the things that are included in this soil health guide that has been used in the high schools is a little bit of um, uh, well, soil health as well and, and some of the experiments that we're doing. So they are very interested in that part, but also it's kind of very adaptable to what the professors in each of the high schools are doing. So we have um, nutrients and soil health and maybe some of the 
microorganisms that we can find in the soils. But that's been adapted to each of the professors' availability to teach that. Um, one of the activities that they made last year was they had these little cameras that are like microscopes for the cell phones. So the students could do that and take pictures and take a look at the soils and see what organisms are there. And some of the students were able to go to the research sites and learn how to take soil samples and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, they were very interested mostly in making their own experiments. So what we are hoping to do next, well, this year or next year, when we get back to the high school curriculum would be get them more involved and maybe obtain some of the data that they could use in fairs for their high school and everything. So that's the direction that we're going. Yeah, I would just add one of the things we're really trying to do is introduce these students to not only the on-farm research, but the outreach process and how on-farm research influences um, use of conservation practices on farms. Um, and so we did ask each group this year to put together some, some sort of outreach product, um, knowing that these students are probably a lot more creative and computer savvy than we are. So we're trying to get beyond the, you know, guide sheets and, um, uh, you know, reports of that nature, circulars, extension circulars. And, and so that was kind of exciting to see the students Put together videos, uh, YouTube videos, and and things like that. So, um, I think next year we'll maybe give a little more direction on outreach and the kinds of things that they could come up with. But uh, they were pretty creative this year, and um, I think maybe they can help us be a little more innovative in how we share information from research as well. Thanks, Amy. That's pretty interesting stuff. Um, since we've got you on here, Amy, environmental pro here, uh, we've got a question uh, regarding um, bacteria runoff um, with a manure application. So are, are you seeing any, are, are y'all even measuring bacteria runoff uh, with uh, the beef manure applications? And if so, are the wood chips that you're applying reducing that runoff? So we're not doing any runoff collection and analysis on these sites. Um, we did, we did, we have done some studies at one of our uh, local research farms that's near Lincoln, um, where we're able to put in plots that have metal borders around them and we can channel runoff into a trough where we're collecting it and then we can analyze and, and you know, figure out volume of, of runoff and, and what it's carrying. And so we've done several trials over the last um, six to eight years that looked at, um, for instance, setback distances that are required to um, minimize nutrient runoff, um, uh, looking at retention of nutrients and runoff of nutrients, um, microbes, um, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and genes. So we've, we've done qu quite a bit of work on that. Most of those papers you could find published in transactions of ASABE. Um, John Gilley is one of the lead scientists on those. So if you search um, for John Gilley and, um, and my name together, you would find all the papers that we've, we've published together on that. So, um, so not in our current on-farm research, but we do have, we have done several studies and, and are continuing to do several that are looking at runoff um, of constituents based on different manure application methods and manure types and setback distances and residue uh, management, things like that. Matt, you're muted. Matt, you're muted. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, the question is, um, has, has anyone seen data that could uh, present uh, showing a potential for any 
significant infiltration reduction. Um, they could reduce uh, flooding frequency. Um, and and kind of what what uh, measurements would you sample for uh, besides just uh, water infiltration rates in the field? Um, and so just on my limited experience with um, use of cover crops and no-till uh, in Arkansas, um, like I said, we're, we're getting, in general, we're getting deeper infiltration of, of our water, whether from irrigation or rainfall. Um, and then also, um, you know, some of our, when you compare no-till, no cover crop to, uh, um, or when you compare conventional till, no cover crop to a cover crop no-till system. Um, the water wicks up the beds. Uh, we, have, we grow a lot of crops on beds because we have poor internal drainage. We have clay hard pans in Arkansas. Um, and so water wicks up to the top of the beds, um, increasing our irrigation efficiency and reducing uh, edge of field water runoff. And so, um, you know, as far as how that translates to flooding on a large scale, I'm not sure, um, but I know it certainly reduces uh, field water runoff and I can't imagine that that would um, not affect large scale flooding um, due to heavy rains. Does anybody else have any comments on that? There's some research published by Charles Wortman um, from here in Nebraska where he was looking at um, uh, erosion, um, erosion and runoff from amended soils, uh, amended with either uh, composted beef manure or no amendment at all. And, and his data was pretty, um, showed pretty significant improvements in um, better water infiltration and less runoff and erosion from plots that receive manure. Um, so I can put, um, type his name here in the chat box if you want to look up his work. Um, but I'm not on a larger scale, you know, kind of on a, a field scale. Um, I'm not familiar with um, those kinds of studies done here, but that's the only one I can speak to. I mean, I just would, would say that water infiltration is a critically important uh, property of soil and uh, especially for, you know, our region ability for a soil to accept and store. Um, it's not a easy measurement to take. You do it in the field and it's kind of a pain. It takes a long time. It's highly spatially variable. I mean, all these things that all these strikes against it. Uh, in terms of a lab test, the closest thing to get to it would be a measurement of aggregate stability, um, which would be, you know, there's not very many commercial labs that actually run this right now. I know that Cornell Soil Health Lab will do that as a rainfall simulation, but um, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. We all recognize how important it is, but it's just physical structure and soil. You know, our framework is to sample with the core, send it to a lab. The variability is uh, smoothed over by grinding the soil immediately. And once you do that, you, um, <laughs> you don't have any physical structure anymore. So uh, we need to think about other ways to do that. Um, it's a great question, but fortunately, it's just a tough nut to crack, so. All right, anybody else? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up. I just want to thank all of our speakers, um, all of our university folks and students. Um, Michael, thanks so much. Well, you're a farmer and you, you're busier than probably any of us. And uh, we just appreciate your time here uh, speaking with us. Um, and I just appreciate all the, the expertise and the, the willingness to contribute today. Um, it was certainly beneficial for me and I enjoyed it thoroughly. So um, thanks again. and. Uh, uh, if there's not any more questions, we'll go ahead and end.